Would you turn with me to uh, Romans 11? I'll be reading verses 18 through 22. I'll be reading out of the New King James. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Good evening. It's good to be back with you again this evening. I'd encourage you to leave your Bible open there for a moment to uh, Romans chapter 11, where our scripture reading was just taken from. Now, as you see on the screen behind me, uh, the title, the topic for tonight is The Balance of God. As we think about that, that word balance, we understand that there is a great need for balance in many areas of life. Uh, whenever we, we think about a, a building as it is being constructed, we know that a great deal of preparation goes into making sure that the surface is level and is ready uh, for the foundation. We understand that as the building is being built, that it has to have a level of balance in order for it to remain uh, strong, in order for it to endure throughout the years. We think about our own personal life and we can think about how balance is important for you and important for me. For example, if I watch about eight hours of television every day of my life, that's unhealthy. We understand that. If the only food that I eat is the fast food that I get out of the drive through window, I understand that physically that's not healthy. Oh, we understand that if I I'm spending so much time uh, away from my family, away from my children, away from my wife. That's not healthy. We understand that in, in many aspects of our life, there is a need for balance, and we understand that. There's also a need for us as Christians to live a balanced Christian life. Uh, enough for us to understand that I need to balance not just my responsibilities here on earth, but also my commitment and my devotion to God. We understand these things. But I wonder if, if we're ever guilty of neglecting to study and understand the perfect balance of our God. We learn about His balance here in this text in Romans chapter 11, uh, about the, the perfect balance of our God. I believe that many of you would probably agree with me if I was to make the statement that our world, generally speaking, doesn't really understand God, doesn't understand who God is. Uh, you, you can pull off somebody from the street who uh, believes that there, there is a God, but they're not, they wouldn't refer to themselves as religious. You wouldn't catch them in, inside of a church building, but they know a few things that they've heard. And you ask them to explain to you who is God, you would probably get a variety of answers, most of which probably aren't reflected in Scripture, but rather they're a depiction of who they want God to be. And, and who they think that God should be based on their own understanding. But the scripture reveals to us a different God. A, a God that, that really has, has two sides as this text reveals. We're going to begin looking at number one uh, tonight is the goodness of God. Some translations use the word kindness, the kindness of God. We, we have a good God. Amen, church? Are you awake this evening? We have a good God. Amen, church? God, God is good all the time. We understand that. Uh, we, we know that our God is good, and He bestows nothing but goodness upon His children. What would it do to your life if you did not believe that God has shown you goodness? I believe it, it would do one of, one of two things. Either it would depress you, and you would think, oh, why, why doesn't God love me? Why doesn't God give me His blessings? Or you would start boasting because you would look at the things that you have accomplished in your life and think, well, well God didn't do that for me. I, I did that for me. We need to understand that we do have a good God. I want to look at some biblical examples of this. Genesis chapter 2, we know this well. We know that in Genesis, uh, in the opening chapters, is where God uh, created the world. He created all of the things that, uh, that, that nature has to offer for, for us, for His children, for His creation. And we know there in Genesis 2, as he's 
going around seemingly throughout his creation and looking at this part, this aspect, and saying, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then he looks at Adam, who does not yet have a partner by the name of Eve, and he said, that's, that's not good. It is not good for him to be alone. And so God makes this, this perfect helper, this perfect helpmeet for Adam to give him what it was that he needed, what he truly desired, even before Adam knew it himself. God is good. We read just the following chapter in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. This is after Eve and Adam had both fallen prey to sin. And God was speaking, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Even though Adam and Eve willingly chose sin... They chose to disobey God. God, in His goodness, says, Even though you've done that, I'm going to send my Son. I'm going to send one that will defeat Satan. I'm going to send someone that, that is going to be able to take your sin away, even though you chose to leave me. I'm going to make that available for that to go away. God is good. As we continue in Genesis chapter 6, if you study the uh, early chapters of Genesis, you will read that it doesn't take you very long to read from the time that the earth was created until the time that God looked at the people and said, I need to wipe them out. I need to, to get rid of this. There's just evil everywhere. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 and following says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Man and animals, creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. You might read that, those few verses and think, I thought we were talking about God's goodness. Here, here we're reading this, this passage about God looking at sin, and he was so disgusted by it. He says, I'm sorry I've made them. I'm going to blot them out as if they were never here. Here's where God's goodness is. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. We find that God's goodness is on display even in the midst of seemingly utter chaos. As God was faithful to those who were faithful to him. But what about the New Testament? I don't know if you've ever heard this. There's an idea that, that the Bible talks about two gods. That there are some people that, that believe that we read about the Old Testament God and then the New Testament God as if they were different entities. Well, what about some New Testament examples? Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When Jesus was on this earth during his ministry, he showed the goodness of God. Even though we deserve to bear the full weight of our burdens, Jesus doesn't want us to. He said, come to me and I will give you rest. We have a good God. Ephesians chapter 2, we don't have time this evening to read the entire context, but I would encourage you to really study if you haven't recently. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And if that passage doesn't tell us about God's goodness, I don't know what does. Ephesians chapter 2, we will uh, just read verse 8 together. As he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. This text doesn't show God's goodness. I'm not, I'm not sure what does. Uh, why did God choose this method of salvation, some have asked. Why did God choose for, for us to be saved by, by grace, as we're referred to here in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, rather than just give us a, a, a simple list of tasks for us to accomplish, and that's how we would obtain our salvation. I would submit to you it's to uh, show us His, his goodness. If you look at that text at the beginning there in verse 1, it reminds us that I was dead in my sins. I was dead, and he gave me the opportunity to be alive. 
Why did God choose to save me by His grace? To remind me that He is God and I am not. And how, how much I desperately need Him. John chapter 3 and verse 16, we know this well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We know that well. Our, our culture, our society even knows at least bits and pieces of that verse because it's comforting, and we should know it. Well, we should allow that verse to sink into our heart because God is good, and that is one, another, that is one more proof. I, I'd ask you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. The first, in 1 John chapter 5, this will be the last verse we look at dealing with this point this evening. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, is there, there is one verse that if somebody was to ask me, what is your favorite Bible verse, I would probably come to this passage. Now, like a lot of you, my favorite passages change from time to time dealing with what's going on in my life, what I've been studying recently. But I find myself continually coming back here to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. The Bible says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I want to read that one more time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I hope that it excites you whenever you read in the Word of God that God has given us the ability to know that we're going to heaven, to know that we have salvation. If somebody were to ask you if, if the Lord were to return tonight, if this was the day of judgment, will you be in heaven, what would you say? Would your answer be, I don't know? Boy, I hope so. I hope I've been good enough, but... We all know none of us have been good enough. Amen, church? Well, we haven't been good enough. We rely upon that grace. We rely upon that, that goodness. But what a comforting thought that is. That God tells us within his, his word, I've given you what you need to know. If you are willing to submit to me through obedience, you can know you have eternal life. What a tremendous blessing. Our God is a good God. I do believe it's very important that we, we paint a, a, an even picture. So we, we began this evening by talking about how, how good our God is, and He is good. Sadly, that's where many people want to stop. And that, that's where many want, want to, to end their study of God and His nature, of, of how good He is and how much He loves us, because that is a good message to hear. Let's just stop there. The Bible doesn't stop there, and I don't believe we should either. As we go back to our main text for this evening, in Romans chapter 11, I, I want to begin again reading for you in verse 20. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 20, says, That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Number one, we talked about the goodness of God. Number two, for your outline, we need to understand the, the severity of God. We do have a good God. The Bible tells us we also have a severe God. Let's look at some Old Testament, some New Testament examples again. I think that's important for us to get the full picture of God. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it, it reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We, we have a new covenant that we're under today, but we have the same God. God never changed. In the Old Testament example, we find Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, where God was giving instruction to Adam and Eve, and he said, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Seems harsh. It's severe. I want to recall your mind to 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we read about a man by the name of Uzzah, where Uzzah was walking alongside the, the ark as it was being transported. And they, he reached up as the, the cart stumbled, and he looked up and surely thought the, the ark was going to fall. And you try to place yourself in, in Uzzah's shoes and wonder, what, what would you have done if you were him in that moment? I'm sure he probably just didn't, didn't think about what he was doing by reaching up to steady the ark. Or maybe if he did think about it, he thought maybe he was doing God a service by not allowing that to touch the ground. 
We know the account there in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that as Uzzah reached up and he touched that ark to balance it to keep it from falling, Uzzah died because Uzzah disobeyed God. We read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 2. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 2, we read about Nadab and Abihu. It says, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized before the Lord which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. While talking about how important our worship is to God with our high school class a few weeks ago, we studied this passage. And we looked at, well, what happened? Well, God uh, sent fire to consume Nadab and Abihu. Well, what were they doing? They were worshiping him. I want you to let that sink into your mind for a minute. As Nadab and Abihu were worshiping God, God killed them. Now, God did not say, do not do this, and they ignored him and they did it. They did something God did not authorize them to do, and God killed them. We think, well, that's harsh. It is severe. What about the New Testament example? Acts chapter 5, we read about Ananias and Sapphira. We read about them as this... This couple that had sold some land and they took some of that money and they gave it to the church. What a wonderful act. At least it could have been. We know their account that where they stumbled was that they wanted everyone to know that they were giving everything that they sold the land for when in fact they kept part of it for themselves. They had a heart issue. And even though they had just sold property and probably given a large sum of money to be used by the church, their heart wasn't right. And God killed them. That's harsh. It's the severity of our God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'd encourage you to turn there with me. This will be our last text that we look at this evening. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. It says, This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We have this picture that's painted of the day of judgment. When he appears that he'll come in this flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on two groups of people, One that doesn't know God, and the other that refused to obey. They refused to to obey the gospel, that those would feel that, what we would call harsh, what the Bible calls severity of God. There's good news. Our God is a, a God of balance. I'd like to encourage you to turn back one last time to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, as we're looking at this perfect balance of our God, of His goodness, and of his severity. Verse 22 of Romans 11. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. So here's the good news for us. We know that our God is a good God. We also know that our our God is a severe God. But the great news for me and the great news for you is that We get to choose which side of God we want to see. We get to choose if we want to have His goodness and His blessings bestowed upon us because we continue to walk in Him. Or we can choose whether we want to see His severity because we read His Word and we say, I don't want anything to do with that, and we turn our back on Him. Our God is a good God that from the very beginning, from the very first time that man chose to leave him for sin, has been calling them back, wanting them to be in that relationship with him, and he wants that relationship with you. And with everyone that you know, he wants that. And it's up to us to decide that we want that too. If there's someone here this evening, and you look at your life, and you think, I have not taken advantage of the goodness that God has offered. If the Lord was to return tonight in my current state, I would fall into one of those categories, one of those that that doesn't know God, or maybe the other one that even though I, I know of God, I've, I've chosen to this point in my life to not obey. I'd encourage you that if that describes you tonight, that you don't leave 
these doors tonight without being right with God. To make that decision that I want God's goodness. I want God's blessings eternally. If we can help you in your walk with God this evening, we'd invite you to come as together we stand and we sing the song of invitation.